And a very good morning. Welcome back. Behind the scenes interview time here on Worcester Radio. Joining us in studio this morning talking always agriculture is Rory Levandusky from the OSU Extension Office here in Wayne County. Before we talk about today's subject, Rory, as always, a very good morning. Good to have you back in. Thanks, Ron. Glad to be here. Well, today we're going to be talking about best management spray practices. One important tool, of course, for the crop farmer is the sprayer. It's a piece of equipment used to apply everything from herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, and even fertilizer uh, in some cases. And today we're going to discuss with Rory best management spray practices. To begin with, Rory, why do we need to talk about, as I said, best management practices? Um, the reason for that, and also let's delve right into it. What are some of the best management practices out there. Okay. Well, I'd like to provide just a little more background as I answer these questions. Uh, so as you mentioned, Ron, the sprayer is an important piece of equipment on farms, and that includes uh, agronomic crop farms, horticultural fruit and vegetable farms, and, and yes, even on organic farms. Uh, I think it's important to talk about best management spray practices because now, more than ever, uh, farm practices are really being scrutinized and watched by by non-farmers, uh, so we have to do things right. So again, there's that need to do things like pesticide application, or really any type of spray application correctly and safely. So best management spray practices really focus on knowing and following the label, uh, looking at droplet size, boom height, and then weather conditions. Okay, you mentioned a couple, so let's talk about each of those practices in a little more detail, Rory, beginning with following the label. What kind of information is contained in the label? And again, why is it so important to make sure that you follow that? Yeah, well, I'll start by saying that the label is the law. So the spray applicator is responsible for all the information contained in the label. And often uh, that label for a spray product is really, it's a multi-page document. Uh, it includes things like rates, uh, a listing of ingredients, directions for use, uh, the crops that are labeled for that specific product what kinds of restrictions or cautions need to be watched for, environmental statements, uh, personal protective equipment statements, storage requirements, uh, sprayer cleaning and product disposal information, uh, even more. So that, you know, a lot of information on that label. And again, the applicator is responsible to know that. So again, those are all general categories of, of things that are on the label. Each category then on that label is going to contain more detailed information. And really the reason is to ensure that that product performs as advertised and, and promote it. So those manufacturers have put a lot of dollars into it. They want to make sure it, it works well, so that, those label instructions. Uh, they also want to make sure that product is used in a responsible manner. You mentioned droplet size. Rory, why is that important and why is that also included when you're talking about best management practice? Well, with any spray application, the applicator is always trying to balance coverage with minimizing drift and preventing off-target movement of that uh, particular pesticide or product. So droplet size really relates to both the drift potential and the coverage. Smaller droplets, uh, it's true, smaller droplets can result in better coverage, but the, the kicker here, the caveat, is provided those droplets actually make it to the plant leaf target because as droplet size decreases, the potential for drift and off-target movement increases. Uh, larger droplets on the other end, they have more mass, uh, so really our sprayers operate uh, from the time that droplet's released at the sprayer tip. Uh, it's basically a gravity system, so larger droplets have more mass, which means they're more likely to fall rather than be carried away. Uh, however, we have to realize that for any given rate or volume, as described typically in gallons per acre, so farmers think about applying at, you know, maybe 10 or 15 or 20 gallons per acre, uh, whatever that rate is, uh, for that whatever given rate, the number of droplets a nozzle produces will actually decrease as that droplet size increases. All right. If larger spray droplets are desirable, but the, the results in, in less total droplets produced, then what does the spray applicator then need to do to increase plant coverage when you're looking at it that way? Yeah, that's a very good question uh, because really a common thought uh, that's out there is that, well, if we want to get better coverage, then we have to increase spray pressure, almost like, uh, you know, we're going to drive it down into the plant uh, canopy. So the idea of, of increasing spray pressure to get better plant coverage or, again, that better penetration. However, uh, 
we know and, and uh, we've demonstrated these uh, at some of our winter meetings with a sprayer table, but increasing that pressure actually decreases droplet size. And then those small droplets may never reach the target. Uh, they don't have that mass, again, that they need to penetrate the plant canopy. So uh, if you look at it closely, you crank up the pressure and then you get smaller droplets and they kind of float away. They don't really go down, they, they float away. Uh, so the answer really to get better coverage is to use more volume to bring that droplet count back up, keep that droplet size larger, and allow those heavier droplets to get down into the plant canopy. Now, so for example, uh, let's say I may need to increase my spray volume from 10 gallons per acre to maybe 15 or 20 gallons per acre to get better coverage. Our guest in studio today has been uh, Rory Levandusky from the OSU Extension Office, and it continues to be. We're not quite done yet. Rory, the next best management spray practice is boom height. Why is boom height important? And again, how is the correct boom height determined when you're doing this? Well, boom height is important because it affects nozzle overlap and spray coverage, uh, as well as that potential for drift. Uh, Jason Devenall, who is a sprayer technology specialist with the Ontario Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food, and Rural Affairs. Uh, in a recent interview on, on uh, Sprayer Best Management Practices on a Sprayers 101 website, uh, said the following regarding boom height, and I think it's a, it's a good analogy. He said, imagine holding out your arm and dropping a feather. It's going to move, you know, a ways downwind before landing. Now, climb a ladder and do the same thing. That feather is going to go considerably further, and it's the same way that water droplets work. And then to add insult to injury, Releasing spray from a higher point also prolongs evaporation, and so those droplets then get even smaller, and that just exasperates the problem of, of potential drift. Now, if that weren't enough incentive to lower boom heights, uh, high booms also create inconsistent spray coverage, which is, again, undermines that whole reason for spraying in the first place. Okay, so obviously lower is better, Rory, when it comes to boom height, but when you're talking about the, the best or the ideal hmm. boom height, what is that? Is there only one answer or are there, you know, other factors that weigh into this? Right. That's a, another good question. Uh, the correct boom height is determined by the spacing between nozzles on the sprayer boom and by the spray angle of the actual nozzle you're using. So most sprayer nozzle companies have catalogs with this type of information. For example, uh, T-Jet's a very commonly used nozzle. If I look in the T-Jet nozzle catalog, uh, it'll provide a boom height chart for various nozzle types. Now, according to the T-Jet catalogs, uh, nozzles that are spaced 20 inches apart on booms, which is a pretty common spacing, uh, we need a 35-inch boom height for a 65-degree nozzle, a 30-inch boom height for an 80-degree nozzle, and 20-inch boom height for a 110-degree nozzle. So as our, our angle increases, we can lower that boom height. Uh, that boom height then refers to the distance from the bottom of the nozzle to the target. So uh, that target could be, in some cases, maybe it's the sole surface. In other instances, it might be the top of a crop plant. Uh, sometimes maybe it's, it's you're aiming for the middle of the crop canopy. But uh, that's how we get that, that correct boom height. It's related, again, to the type of nozzle and the spacing on the boom. The final best management spray practice we're going to discuss with Rory today weather conditions and I'm guessing that this has a lot to do with wind speed and not spraying when it's too windy. Are there other weather condition factors that you look at though beyond you know how windy it is? Right well you're correct I mean wind speed uh, is really a big factor it's it's a major driving factor no doubt uh, but even lack of wind speed is, is another factor so most pesticide labels uh, have a section on drift management they specify allowable wind speeds uh, for example, uh, I looked at a common grass control herbicide on the label and it says something like uh, drift potential is lowest between wind speeds of 2 to 10 miles per hour. And so while most of us can uh, pretty readily identify when it's too windy to spray, uh, we also need to be aware that spraying under conditions of no wind is also risky. Spray droplets uh, reach their target faster when there's some air mixing that allows vertical movement. So on a really calm day, no wind, uh, that those conditions also oftentimes signal a temperature inversion and when we get into a temperature inversion that means air moves horizontally uh, it's not moving vertically and so spray droplets from an application made during a temperature inversion have the potential to move significant distances uh, there have been documented cases of you know half a mile up to a mile away uh, when spraying during those really calm conditions in a temperature inversion 
Okay, so beyond wind, are there any other weather conditions the spray applicator needs to think about? Uh, sure. Temperature and humidity also have an impact on spray effectiveness. So if we get those low humidity, high temperature days, uh, that's going to increase the evaporation rate of spray droplets. And again, as droplets evaporate, they become smaller, they lose mass, they become more subject to drift, especially again if you have high boom heights. Uh, in addition, some products have increased potential to volatilize, that is to change from a liquid to gas state and then move uh, as we get into high temperatures. All right, Rory, uh, plenty of good information you brought with you today. If anybody needs more information or wants to find out more about what we talked about today, what should they do? They can contact me at the Wayne County Extension Office at 330-264-8722. They can also check out our website at wayne.osu.edu. Once again, our guest in studio behind the scenes this morning here on Worcester Radio, Rory Levandusky from the OSU Extension Office, talking today about the best management spray practices. Rory, as always, appreciate you stopping in. Look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thanks, Ron. I enjoyed it.